Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Blitz Growth. Today, I'm super excited because we have an amazing guest here, uh, Ellen, who's going to be sharing a ton of information with us. Um, Ellen and her family are extremely talented musicians that produce American Roots music uh, up in the Ozarks. Uh, we're chatting today to learn how the business has turned into a massive brand and has hundreds of thousands of followers, Patreon subscribers, YouTube followers, like the list just goes on of how many people are actually watching this content. Um, the engagement rates on her social posts are through the roof. So today we're gonna to learn a little bit more about how she does all of this and have a great conversation about uh, how to turn content creation into full-time business. So Ellen, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me, this will be fun. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very impressed, extremely impressed with actually your social uh, presence. Um, you know, even just your YouTube with some of these videos hitting millions and millions of views. Um, so yeah, really excited to dive in and learn a little bit more about the marketing side of, uh, the Petersons. Um, okay. but let's maybe start off with just a quick background about how you guys got started, you know, just from a family band, how did this snowball into this huge kind of like online presence and what now looks like a pretty, pretty big business when it comes to events and online uh, content uh, and all the different ways that now you're monetizing. But how did this all kind of like shift from just a family band into a, into a business? Yeah. So we, I think like most musicians just started off doing it as a hobby. It was something that our whole family could do together um, despite all the age differences. So it started out just something we did to stay connected and then um, we all, no one planned on doing music for a living. That always just seemed like who actually can make it doing that? Nobody can. So we all um, still like went to college and studied different things um, of different interests. And then um, after college, we started getting just like, we were still growing as a band. And so um my siblings and I like made the hard call, like, okay, do we actually give music a shot or do we use these degrees that we've just worked really hard for? Um, we were like, we'll always regret it if we don't just try yeah. to do music. And so um, that was in 2017 that we kind of were like, all right, the last one was through college um, of the three older siblings. And so mm -hmm. we decided to give it a shot. And just like any small business, I mean, we, we made no money for a long, long time playing music together. We truly just did it because we enjoyed it. And so, mm -hmm. but from that love of doing that together, we started gaining a small following and then mm -hmm. it grew and grew. And it was, um, yeah, just a lot of slow growth. And then in 2019 is the first time we actually had like a massive internet growth as opposed to just like our local following, which is what we had. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed one of your top videos on YouTube has like 32 million views or something. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, is our dad the, is, oh, sorry, you West Virginia. And so uh, we covered Take Me Home Country Roads and it just kind of blew up. Yeah, it was very fun. And it didn't like, it wasn't like the second we posted it, it went viral. It like took a bit. So that's the other funny thing about content creation on the internet is you could post something and think it's like, just an average content or, you know, maybe even a flop. And then you wake up then one morning and you're like, oh my goodness, my website got thousands and thousands of views randomly. So yeah, that was very fun. Nice. And then how long were you uploading stuff to YouTube before it really started to like, like pick up traction? Because I think, I'm not sure if that was your first big viral video, but after that, you still had a lot of other hits hitting millions of views, but how long did it take for you? kind of YouTube to start working for you guys? And was there anything you specifically did to help or encourage uh, the growth of YouTube? Yeah, we, I mean, we've posted online for many years, but not consistently. And I think it was in um, 2019 is when we're like, okay, that's it. We really need to put music on YouTube. And so the first video we posted was Jolene and um, we were like just figuring out like how do we even do this do we all like record on different microphones do we do one microphone like can we do it live do we need to lip sync so the audio is better like it was that is when we just started playing with it in 2019 mm -hmm. and we filmed a video um 
in like just in our living rooms is where we started doing it. And we would just have a friend video. And then um, the photographer that takes our band pics was looking more into getting into videography. And so we were like, okay, can you try to video? And so he did, and he's kind of like grown with us. So it's been fun because um, we both were like great friends with him. And so we were like, all right, let's try to do this online video thing. And so we posted maybe three in 2019 and Jolene was the third. And then that's the first one that really hit. And I think it has 20 million views now, which was mm -hmm. Crazy. And that was like, we all of a sudden got a lot of YouTube followers and we were scheduled to leave the country like in a week. So we're like, oh my gosh, we have to post more content now. And we're like, and we're gone. So we like went viral and then we couldn't do anything for a while. So that was frustrating and funny. Oh, wow. No, that's actually quite quick. Um, I feel some of the other people we, we talked to, you know, it takes them years of posting consistently before they start hitting a few, uh, a few videos that kind of get any decent traction. Um, but that's great. And then when you release these videos, do you kind of do any marketing or promotion behind it? Or this is just all YouTube algorithm and organic just taking over? We post about them on our social pages. Um, so my siblings and I will share the link and we have people that follow us there. And of course, like our own Peterson page. But honestly, and I used to put like money to try to like push our content to be like, hey, this person, you know, you do the specific metrics to try to get your video to the right person but now i just don't and the, honestly the algorithm usually gets it to the right person for me so mm. that's been very nice nice yeah no it's great and i think uh yeah i think your content isn't that salesy so youtube probably likes it <laughs> <laughs> we're not really great at being salesy so that's that is very handy <laughs> yeah no that's good that's great um okay and then so I assume kind of like your first like strategy for monetizing, you know, all your talents and this content was kind of like through YouTube advertising dollars or something. What sort of revenue streams have you got uh, set up and how are you kind of like making this business your guys full time job? Yeah, so we do make some money off of YouTube, but most of the stuff we post is cover videos so that, you know, everyone would think. You get 32 million views, but John Denver has made a lot of money off of our music. So we were really excited for him. Um, no, so we do make some money off of YouTube and the original songs that we slip in there definitely help with that. But people don't discover you from original music. So we have to keep posting yeah. a lot of cover songs. Um, and then Patreon also gives us a good revenue stream. And then we also do our live shows. So those mm -hmm. are kind of the three main ways that we're able to support I mean, we have six band members plus an admin plus a sound team plus the video and audio support. guy. So, yeah, it's a lot of people. And thankfully, not everyone uses the Petersons to make a living. So that helps too. But yeah, uh, yeah so we finally found like a good niche with all of those things working together. We can make a living. Yeah, because that's interesting because a lot of content creators start by themselves. But as a band, you've got so many more people to cover. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it even is a little bit more challenging being a band versus an individual because we talk to a lot of individual artists and, you know, they can survive on a lot smaller amount when they first get started. Um, right. So, yeah, even even more challenging when it's a group. So hats off again. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so it sounds like you've kind of like taken the marketing role. Is, that's what, is that what you studied in university as well? So in my undergrad, I actually studied chemistry. And so okay. I worked for a year with my chemistry degree in a lab. And then after a year, that's when I quit and moved back home. I was like, all right, we're doing this music thing. I'm done pipetting and doing all these lab experiments. So um, and then I did I went to grad school for my MBA and I got um, mm -hmm. a graduate certificate in marketing because I mean, so much of the research in marketing I could relate to from being a chemistry major and, you know, using Excel and studying the data. So that part was like kind of a good crossover for me. And I love math. And so um, it was just kind of an easy fix. And I always, even before, you know, chemistry or um, the graduate degree, I just love my family and I love the music that we created. So I always had been the one sharing the content and like posting on social media about it. it just kind of happened that way. So 
as we've all grown in the business, we found like different niches and I hate money. I hate dealing with contracts or negotiation. My brother loves it. So that's what he does. <laughs> He's the reason we get paid, which is awesome. And my sister is really great at music, you know, so there's different niches, but I just love sharing my family. And so that's kind of mm. how I ended up doing the marketing side of it. Got it. Okay. And then, you know, if you know numbers and math and you like doing that, you hopefully you've realized that your engagement rates are just crazy high on Facebook and some of these other social channels that you're, you're posting to. Is there any specific learnings that you've gotten from managing these social profiles on how, you know, people or content creators can, I would say, get higher engagement rates and get more views and get more reach from the organic side of social? Because I know the organic side is getting harder and harder, but you guys seem to be doing a great job at it. So any learnings yeah. there for everybody listening? Yeah, I do think it is important to see like what the algorithm is pushing. So right now, obviously, like that's the reels and the video content, which goes in the favor of my family a lot because that's kind of what we do. Um, but also just trying not to always sell something. So like if I want to post about a show, finding a way instead of just being like, come buy tickets, make sure I'm posting other contents that's just like behind the scenes of my family or just like featuring something and not always asking the audience to do something. But just I mean, they're just interested in our family and what we do. So I try to make a lot of like just natural posts in there and then be like, OK, please come see this concert here by the tickets but that's not all that I use the social media for. It's more of like a behind the scenes look into what mm. we offer. Interesting. And so I take it you've tested a few different types of content, like behind the scenes, high production, low production, images versus video, that sort of thing. Did you kind of do all of that testing and figure that out? Or did you just naturally be like, all right, behind the scenes is what we're going to post? It just was more of like a natural fit for our family. That's kind of what the people are always interested in. And because we're just posting the music videos online, the social media posts were a very good way to like balance it out. So follow us on YouTube to get the full song. But if you want to like get to know each of the band members better, see what we're up to, then you can find that on our social media pages. So it's just like a balance. Got it. And then what has been your strongest social media pages and kind of like in terms of social media, it sounds like that's what drives a lot of the ticket sales for the events. But yeah, what social media channels have you found work the best for you guys? So Facebook has always been um, a great fit for us just because our audience is a little bit older. And so they're naturally more on Facebook, but Instagram would definitely be second just because we're such like a visual content creation business. And so Twitter's fun um, and we're getting into TikTok. I'm still like, Oh, if I don't know, TikTok Another is a whole one. piece. So, um, I posted two and they did really well. And I posted a third and I formatted it better and it didn't do as well. So I was like, I don't know what's happening over here. But um, no, our people um, are definitely on Facebook, and that's definitely the easiest. I can share the events from there, as you know, it's all kind of organized. But Instagram, um, I enjoy a lot more, so I always keep posting on there as well. Mm. Okay, nice. And then I know you guys are kind of a band and you all collaborate together, but do you ever do collaborations with other people on social media or just at events? Or have you seen any benefit from doing collaborations? Because when we talk to a lot of content creators, uh, you know, one of the main ways that they seem to grow their exposure is by doing collaborations with other other artists or, you know, other content creators. Have you guys gone down that path or do you guys stick to your own original content only? We, um, there's a band called Raina Del Cid and she's amazing. Um, and she works a lot with, um, a girl named Tony. And so we did a collaboration with them at the beginning and it was super beneficial. Um, I think it definitely exposed us to the right people in her audience. And we did a video with her channel and she did a video with ours and it was awesome. Since then we, our schedule is just so weird. Like we're not on the road touring like most other music groups because we have a stable residency in Branson. And so, um, and we also, with our little sister being in school, we've just tried to keep up enough content to even post on our own stuff. But I think once our little sister is out of college, we'll have a little more freedom with our schedule to be able to kind of do things like that, which would be fun. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's, 
you know, a blessing and a curse, the online stuff. It's uh, it's it's a blessing because you don't have to go on these tours, but it's also a curse because I suppose the tours are also a bit fun for uh, for artists. Yeah, they it's a hit and miss. If you can tour well, they are a lot of fun. If you are touring on a budget, they are not as quite as fun. <laughs> the food is a little less glamorous, and so is the lodging. Um, but we, I mean, we love traveling. We always have. We did it before we made any money doing music, mm -hmm. so it's fun. Um, but as we've gotten older, I think sleeping in your own bed and cooking your own food, and I'm married, so I love being at home with my husband. That We love staying in Branson for that. Um, but yeah, when we were early in our twenties, absolutely. We loved being on the road. We just, we're getting old. <laughs> Standards are increasing. I know. <laughs> uh, okay. That's awesome. Um, and now in terms of your guys' content, so there's obviously so many people that do cover songs. Why do you think so many people are interested in your guys' cover music or your guys social media channels when there's so many others out there like what do you think makes your channel unique or your content unique yeah so something we've loved doing is taking pop songs or rock songs or whatever and putting like the american roots sound on it and we also we are a very vocal heavy group and so um, there's a, like, we are by no means extremely talented musicians. Our Dobro player in it is, and my sister Katie's really great on the fiddle, but the rest of us are very average musicians. But I think people like the complimentary sound that we have, and we just play so much together. We kind of have a groove and a sound that we've had. So people just really enjoy hearing our like trademark sound specifically on different songs and i think the arrangements that my sister comes up with with emma and my mom are really pretty so it's not just taking a song and spitting it back out just with our instruments they kind of try to do something special with it which is fun hmm. interesting okay and then for anybody who's maybe just getting started in whether it be music a band online distribution or even events you know is there anything you would have done differently any advice you would give someone who's maybe like you know, two or three years behind you? Yeah, I would just say keep trying different things. I mean, the number of things we failed at and didn't make money at for years has all like come back to help us eventually. So don't get discouraged if you put up YouTube videos and it doesn't catch, you never know. Um, there might be another social platform like TikTok that comes around and you fit really well. So you just take those videos and reformat them up. So like, don't get discouraged if something that you do doesn't work out. Um, and then really love what you do. So if you just think everyone else wants to hear like a country artist or an indie artist, don't just try to be that. If you actually love the music that you're playing, then the audience will see that and respond to that as well. So don't just try to make the sound that you think is trendy. Just stay to what you really enjoy. And I think that will always pay off. Nice. And then in terms of, you know, what you've been doing on the marketing side, it seems like you know, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube have been big. Is there anything else that's worked really, really well for you guys in terms of, you know, filling events, uh, tickets, or even, you know, filling Patreon? Um, cause I know you've got a ton of Patreon, uh, subscribers. Um, you know, is there any other marketing tactics you've used to grow a ticket event sales or your Patreon? I think for ticket event sales, something, um, is always reach out to where you're going. So um, when we were traveling many years ago, you know, find maybe a couple local churches and reach out to them or um, maybe, I don't know, there's like a club or something that you think would really enjoy and get them, you know, maybe you get them a great discount so then they bring their family and friends to the concert. So just go to where you're playing and then see what might be a good idea to grab like at least one local hub. Maybe it's getting um, a local group to open up for you. So they bring their following in and then they stay around for yourself. So just find out where, if you're trying to sell tickets to an event, see what's good and local there and then use those resources. Um, and then just always keep posting like on your website or online content. I, I think consistently putting stuff out there on all the platforms will always pay off too. So um, I don't know, it always, if I'm looking to see like, oh, who's this group? And I look on Facebook and they haven't posted on three years, 
it's kind of like discouraging. But if I see, even if it's just small stuff, keeping people updated, even if it's not, you know, getting a ton of engagement, I think it is important to consistently put stuff out there. Mm. Okay. And then do you do anything in the email marketing side of things? Do you delve into that or do you just keep it all social? Yeah, we do some email marketing mostly for um, if we launch new products or that is like mostly asking for people. So I'll give some family updates, but that is purely salesy is usually the email marketing. I That's where I tell people sign up for our email list and that's when you'll find out when we're going on the road. So a lot of mm-hmm. people sign up keep updated on our tour schedule um, and they can do that. We've collected a lot of emails through our website and other social channels and through our live shows, which has been good. Mm. Wait, how you, how do you collect emails at a live show? Do people like submit we them? Do, uh, yeah. There's like a text link. So text this word to this number and you'll sign up to receive uh, our emails. Um, we, oh, because cool. most people are in our Branson show. So like we might be going to where you live. And so you won't have to travel, you know, eight hours to see us next time, which would be nice. Mm, got it. What do you use to do that? Is there like software or something that you use? Yeah. Um, I've switched through the years. I honestly can't remember the name of the platform, but if you just like Google, um, you know, text message marketing just for email list, you'll find there's so many different options and you can see. Um, and I've changed as the as the list has grown too, because it has to support you know X amount of um, mm. customers in the database. So there might be one Got that it. would work best for someone's list. But it's different to the email marketing service that you use. They're two separate tools, correct? Uh, yeah, and it like logs it in, so they like are incorporated. So someone will mm. sign up through the text list, and then it'll go straight to my Mailchimp. Got it. Okay, awesome. And I think. Um, Next few questions I want to definitely ask about the Patreon. Um, yeah. That seems like it's been very well thought out. Like going through the tiers, um, it's really Good. cool how you've differentiated <laughs> the tiers. And I think it's it's really clever. But for those who are listening, um, could you explain a little bit about how you came up with those tiers and kind of why you thought of those bonuses at each tier level and which ones people like the most? Yeah, yeah. Um... I threw our Patreon together in a mad panic uh, right at the beginning of um, the pandemic when all of our shows got canceled. And so um, I'd been married about two months and my husband's also a musician. We both were newlywed and unemployed. And so I was like, no, it's a great time to start a Patreon page for the Petersons. So I like didn't sleep for a week and just really thought hard about all the tiers and the wordings and Patreon was awesome onboarding me. And so I worked with a specific um, person from their platform and I had all these like lofty ambitions. I was like, okay, I'm going to send out personal birthday cards to everyone. And she's like, no, you will not do not put that. I'm like, I could do it. And she's like, don't you dare put that in your thing. And so I was like, okay, okay. I'm so glad. There was like so many personalized options that I really wanted to throw in. And they were like, you will not be able to keep it up. And they were so Mm -hmm. right. So we only, the only personal thing we do is in our highest tier. And it's one of my favorite things we do, which is we sing like a personalized birthday song or anniversary song um, to people. And I love that. And I wish I truly could do that for everyone, but it was just unrealistic. So um Basically, the people that are on our Patreon page really believe in our music and they believe in what we're doing. And um, we just had people right at the beginning of the pandemic realize we'd all lost our jobs and they were like, how can we help the Petersons live through this? And so they were already trying to donate and help us, which was incredibly kind. And so Patreon just was a natural fit for, Mm -hmm. hey, we love the Petersons. You want to help us keep playing music? There's six of us in this band here and we got to eat food somehow. So, and now it's like, it's a beautiful test market. So if we are like, we had to pick some Christmas songs to learn. So if I ask YouTube, that's a lot of people. So I ask our Patreon audience. And so they Mm -hmm. really have like a front row seat into voting and having like a big say, because these are the people that love us enough that they want to financially contribute. And so I know that they're like, our like premier target market. And so we test a lot of stuff on them. They do polls on what songs we want to do. And then I just tried to make the tiers as like realistic as possible. So obviously Mm -hmm. I can't really do much 
for um, the lowest tier. But then as it goes on up, I've been able to like spend more time and energy into each of those options. Mm. Yeah. And I think, I think it's spot on where you need to reel in the personalization on the lower tiers. And Mm -hmm. because the other thing I see is like people put all their value in tier one. They don't like stretch it out across multiple tiers. Um, So I thought you did that really, really well. Um, The other thing is, uh, you know, how did you sort of, it sounds like you organically grew the Patreon at the start by just people wanting to support you guys because your shows got canceled. But then what's the main way that you get new Patreon members now? So it's still very organic. So people just discover us online um, and then they find out we have a Patreon page. And it really is like a backstage pass into us. Like my sister answers every single message people send in and um, they have first dibs to all of our concerts and we've sold out multiple concerts. So patrons, if you don't, if you're not in that community, there's a chance that you won't have access And we also, I think our biggest thing is to organically grow up. But then once they're a part of it, we just try to keep them there. So we were like bringing them all the Mm -hmm. brands in and doing like private concerts and like come see brands in with the Petersons. We send out Christmas cards once a year to every single person. And so it's just a lot of like, we want you to come in naturally because you really like what we do. But then once you're in, we want to keep you because you're really getting value out of what we offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's super important because I assume now Patreon is one of the main sources of income and like probably outperforming some of the events or whatever you were doing beforehand. But I do see a lot of content creators set it up and then forget it and they don't necessarily retain those Patreon people. Yeah, no, we like we've made some really great friends, honestly, through the page. Like they have inside jokes and we have like a memes page that's like decorative dedicated to them. So it's all like the behind the scenes. So I think it just, it feels like a really fun community. And we also have a lot of people that um, don't have much community, whether Mm -hmm. the pandemic has forced them to kind of like isolate themselves or I don't know, just different life situations. And so, and we love including people. My family's always done that even before music, we just like hanging out Um, And so it was like such a natural fit for us to like build this online community and invest a lot of effort into it. Mm. And is when you say the communities, are you connecting up discord and doing all of that? Or are you connecting with these people in a different way? How do you build that connection? I suppose. Yeah, it's mostly through the Patreon posts and um, we also through like the Facebook page. Um, Mm. We thought about doing the discord and we set it up initially. And then I was like, Nope can't too complicated yeah so we're doing it we just do the facebook page and then the actual post on patreon and then bringing them in person like whenever we go on the road we do private meet and greets exclusively with the patreon community so we're about to go oh, on that's clever for every show they get to come we do band pictures we do an exclusive q a so it's just but the, i mean we have a lot of patrons that live in europe or um south mm. america or, you know, somewhere else that can't come to concerts. So we have to also provide some value online. So they've, we've recorded shows and just shared it with the patron audience, not with YouTube. So like, Hey, if you can't come to a show because you don't live in the U S here, we'll still like post it online for you. It's going to be hard because it's probably very tempting to post it in as many places as possible. Cause you're like, I've made this content. I want everybody to see it or as many right. people as possible to see it. But then at the same time, you're like, no, I just need to show this to people who are actually paying for the value. Yeah. 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 So that's the other thing we have. I mean, we have several videos that would have gone on our YouTube channel, but it's still just exclusively on the Patreon page. Interesting. Okay. And then, you know, someone who was starting out their Patreon, uh, you know, maybe, you know, this year they've already got a bit of a following. They're looking at monetizing. So they're deciding to do a Patreon. What would be like the main tips that you would give someone who's just starting out with Patreon? Like what were the learnings that you kind of got from, you know, having if you used it for the last few years? Uh, yeah, I would definitely say make the tier, like measuring the value of what you can actually offer realistically um, with what people are going to be paying is the biggest part. So if it truly is, you don't have time to create content exclusively for your Patreon community, then make the value incredibly low and just maybe answer questions. But if you do have, like if what you offer is exclusive content, 
then Patreon could be the way like that you just have it. So sign up and join the Patreon and then you receive the benefit. So I think figuring out that magic value point would be the biggest thing. Um, and then the other thing too is Patreon's a great thing, but it's not a fit for everyone. And so mm -hmm. if you try it and it's not, don't kill yourself trying to make something work that's not working. And so um, some people truly have just a great product to sell like on Etsy or just create content online for YouTube. So it's not for everyone. We have so many people work like my sister exclusively answers messages on Patreon. If it was just me, I would not be able to do the Patreon page. So it's just you working it. That's also like, it's a lot of pressure and then you're not able, mm -hmm. like don't make it something you resent. Yeah. That's interesting. And then are you planning on growing out more tiers at some point or do you feel like you've maxed out on what you can do on there? I think we've maxed out for what we can actually like, again, with the value, if we quit touring and we quit the Branson show, then like, sure, I'd be able to, you know, do a lot more stuff on Patreon. But while we're balancing also our mm -hmm. YouTube channel and the live shows, we're pretty much where we are and we really enjoy it. And yeah, it's, we'll have to figure something else out. <laughs> grow it anymore because we're pretty much at the limit here <laughs> yeah because i think you guys almost have twenty thousand patreon fans thing it's getting close to that oh no no maybe like uh i think we're at uh, like or two thousand yes yeah, yeah yeah close to two thousand sorry extra zero yeah. on there <laughs> <laughs> like not a lot no but they're yeah. like they truly are um if it does work for you, it's really fun because it's a community of people that love what you're doing and want to support it. And I mean, that's what you're trying to find on all the channels anyway. So Patreon mm. is like definitely the favorite thing that we get to do, um, mm. but it wouldn't work just by itself. So keeping up all the other things yeah. as well, it's important. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, all, as you were saying, the YouTube and the social media and all that sort of stuff kind of funnels down to kind of like your email list or Patreon really is like mm -hmm. the two, two places that you can really maintain that relationship with, with your fans. Yeah. Um, and Patreon being a bit better, I suppose, in emails. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that don't want to do Patreon that really want to support our family. So also having other ways. Um, I mean, we have people that don't trust the internet and they find us <laughs> on the internet. So finding ways to like people, sometimes people are like, they want to support us but they don't do any monthly subscriptions. Like it's just something that they don't do. So finding value and like, if someone's not a fan of Patreon, okay, what's another way that they can still be a part of this community, but not do the subscription thing. Mm, okay. And then do you have a private and a public Facebook group, like a, or a paid and a non-paid Facebook group, or you only just do the paid one with Patreon? We, um, that's the main one that we do. Um, Everything else, I mean, we have, there's one that's run by a fan. We don't do anything with it. And that one's awesome. um, pretty active. And then we have one group that is run by us. Um, that's kind of like an inside joke, but it is open to everyone. And then we have the paid um, Patreon yeah. group. But most of the stuff I do is either with the Patreon page or just posting publicly to our own account. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Well, you know, I think you provide so much value for everybody on this, uh, listening into this podcast. I think if you are thinking about, uh, setting up a Patreon, like you guys have a great example. So if you're listening, go check them out. Um, Ellen, where can we find more about you? And then obviously more about the Petersons, um, let us know how we can get in touch, where we can find out about your latest stuff. Um, even on your side, the marketing side. So I think you're actually really, really good at marketing. Um, <laughs> not only performing, <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, definitely our website, petersonband.com um, is the easiest place to find all of the information. Um, and then our YouTube channel is the next place that I usually send people if they want to find out more about the Petersons. And we're on Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, barely on TikTok, but it is a thing. Growing. So, yeah, we'd progress. love to connect with you guys <laughs> through any of those ways. Awesome. Well, you heard it, everybody. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe this podcast if you thought uh, Ellen provided a bunch of value and uh, really appreciate all the time that you've given us. Uh, we'll link to all of these amazing places in the show notes. Uh, make sure that everybody can access uh, or get access to all of those platforms for you. But Ellen, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. 
Thanks for having me, it's been fun. Hey guys, we put a bunch of effort into making great content for this YouTube channel. So please hit subscribe, uh, leave us a comment, hit like, and tell a few friends about it.